we missed a couple uh, things here on the announcements and uh, prayer requests. Uh, Roger Simpson got new hearing aids, and they, he had a surplus of batteries for the old ones. So if you wear hearing aids and would like some batteries, check with Roger and see if they work with yours, okay? So, uh, so Roger, do this so they all know who you are. He's the hearing aid battery guy. So. <laughs> Check with him if you need those. Also, we had another prayer uh, request for Richard uh, Seeley, uh, there, Cindy's husband. Uh, he has uh, E. coli colitis. Uh, he's pretty sick with that. So if you could add uh, Richard to the prayer chain, it would be wonderful as well. And I just wanted to uh, let the Keen girls know that there's an old saying that goes around. I'm not sure if it applies now, but something about like the nut doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> You might want to hang on to that. <laughs> All right? Let's go ahead and go to the Lord, shall we? Father God, we come to you today. And Lord, we want to thank you and praise you for the beautiful morning you give us today. Lord, we ask you in the name of Jesus that your hand would be upon us. Uh, we pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to us in your word. Father, again, we, we just want to thank you and praise you that we have this great privilege to come together as like-minded believers to study your word and to be able to move forward. Lord, uh, again, we just ask you to bless us with the Holy Spirit's presence as we go through this service today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. My fuzzy? My now? Okay. I have a new mic, so we thought that was the issue, but maybe that ain't it, so. I tried to tell them Thursday night it's because I'm such a live liar that it interferes, but they aren't buying that either, so I, I don't know. We'll move forward. We've been studying the book of Esther so far. Uh, we've been through the, the first chapter. We're in chapter two now. Um, so far in our study, uh, we've been introduced to Ahasuerus, the king, Vashti, the queen, and we met the king's seven eunuchs and the seven princes of Persia and Media. They're also known as the 14 guys with hard to pronounce Persian names. So, um, King Hashuerus, he was presented as a hard partying egomaniac, prideful to a fall. Queen Vashti was presented as very beautiful, yet disobedient uh, to her husband. So we left off last week with the queen losing her crown and title, and she was never to be in the king's presence again. So let's pick up with chapter 2 of Esther. Uh, we'll start at verse 1 and read through verse 18. These things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgin, virgins be sought out for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all of the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given to them, and let the young, women who ple the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. Now there was a Jew in Susa the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jaar, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with, with Jehoiakim, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadasha, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susha, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai. And a young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food. And with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. 
And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. We'll stop there for now and, and see how time goes. We can come back to that. Okay, so in verse 1 of chapter 2, it says, After these things. Now the account picks up four years after Bashtai has been banished from the king and sent away from him. So four years later, the king, Ahasuerus, has been busy fighting that losing war he started with Greece. Okay? Uh, the year would be approximately 479 B.C. Now, the king lost that war. We spoke of that previously, right? And not only did he lose the war, but he was humiliated in the loss. They just beat the tar out of him and his people. So he come back home, and he's, uh, he's beat up from the war. His plans failed. Remember, they spent six months. You know, in chapter one of that, we learned that they spent six months feasting and planning this attack, right? And then at the end of that six month period, they had one week, seven days of fasting again to share the, the plan with everybody. So now he has to come home and he remembers now, he's beat up, I'm sure probably depressed and, and all that, he comes home and he starts thinking, I don't even have a queen. And he's feeling pretty bad about that. The, the attack didn't pan out. Plus he remembers how badly he handled the queen's situation. Remember, he didn't really make decisions on his own. The young men, the wise men, the astrologers and that, yeah, gave him this plan to get rid of her. And it wasn't only a bad plan that he's got to live with now, but because of the royal decree, he had no way to fix or repair the relationship with her. Because remember the Persians, when, when the king made a decree, that was for life. They could not be changed or rescinded in any way. So now he's looking, you know, I had lost the war. I looked foolish there. I sent my queen away. I have no one, no shoulder to cry on, you know, and that. And uh, so it's bad for me, poor me. You know, he's uh, Ahasuerus in all his glory in the big kingdom he has, throwing a great big pity party at this time for him. He has a cooler head, but it's much too late to deal with the situation properly. So from just that part, think for a minute, don't raise your hand. It's not important you do that. Have you ever done or said something that later on, that you, as you thought about it, you said, boy, I really wish I hadn't done that. I'm sure probably most everybody has something that they can think of that, oh man, I really wish I hadn't said that, or I hadn't said it that way or I hadn't done that, right? But today I would handle it totally different. And most of us can come up with something like that, right? In different degrees, all of us, right? Now just imagine the whole country knows about it. Not just you and your private circle of friends or family that were there to witness it. Now the whole country knows about it. See, that's where Ahasuerus' head was at this point in time because he comes back to the palace. So um, we have an idea kind of from our lives and our past and how we lived, how he felt at that time. And I know when it comes to counting things I wish I hadn't done or said, I could jump up and down and wave all day long, you know? And, and God has helped me with that, you know? I still do and say dumb things, as you all have recognized. But, you know, but, but God helps me. He forgives me. And, you know, and, and as I seek to change. But see, Ahasuerus isn't a godly man at this point. So he doesn't have God that he can go to to seek forgiveness and to seek strength to find his way through this. So what does he do? We're told in verses 2 through 4, it says in the scripture, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 1. I'm sorry, excuse me. See, I told you I'd be dumb. Thank you. <laughs> chapter 2. After these things, when the king, when, <laughs> okay, who started that up here? <laughs> After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, 
He remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Now, we're here too. Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be brought out for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susha, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given to them. And let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. So he's listening to this group of guys again, another plan. Now, we're going to see here something else about that in a minute. The king's wise men come up with a plan to cheer the king up. Nobody wants to be subject under a uh, despondent and depressed king, right? That's not good for anybody. So he, they want to do something to help him out, to find another wife to replace Vastai. Now, we need to remember, back when they made this, this ruling, helped the king come up with this decree that he signed and sent out, they don't want her back because of their plan that got her ousted from the king's presence and that they, they know she would seek vengeance on them. And so they want her to have nothing to do with it. So they want the king to find someone to replace her. Now, Persian kings, they had the right to claim a young woman as an addition to their harem, which amounted to a, a collection of concubines. And concubines is just a building full of mistresses, is all that is. So, um, they, he had the right to do that by their law and their customs. And he appointed officers to locate all the beautiful young virgins in the kingdom and bring them to Susha and hand it over to Haggai, who took care of the king's harem, it says. Now, to take care of the harem, that meant that all these young ladies would go under a full year of beauty treatments, training, and purification rites prior to becoming part of the king's harem. Now, they enjoyed courtly privileges and status and were housed separately from the rest of the, the king's household, the rest of the palace. They weren't intermingled with anything. The only one they had anything to do with was the eunuch in charge of them and the king himself. And so it uh, wasn't a very good deal. But anyway, the king likes this idea, right? So it was put into motion. And the young lady is given to Haggai, the king's eunuch, to see that all these procedures are followed. Now it sounds like being selected to become part of the king's harem and live in, in this royal setting, and that would be great. But this beauty contest, if you want to look at it that way, was not such a lucky thing for these young ladies. They were guaranteed a lifetime of frustrated isolation just in the harem. That's the only place they were allowed. They were unable to see their families. In exchange, they might spend one night, only one night, of their lives with their royal husband. And we'll see how that works in here in a little bit again. And never again would they see a man except for the eunuch that was in charge of them. They didn't bear children unless it was the king's. Luxurious food and clothes they would have, but their quarters were hot and cramped. And not just the young ladies suffered, but back at home in their villages and the provinces that they were taken from, some young men didn't get married. All the pretty girls were taken for the king. Now, were they taken under duress, or did they just simply volunteer to become part of this process? Scripture doesn't really tell us that. But one can only imagine there must have been fathers and mothers who lied to the officials that came. Oh, we don't have a daughter. Or you don't want her. She's mean and nasty. Don't take her to the palace. You know, leave her at home. You know? And there was, would have been some young ladies who would have run out and married the neighbor man there, the young guys, so they didn't get taken in that. We don't know that. But we know what kind of a life it was if they had real. You know, Everything looks good, don't it? See, this is a world thing. Being part of the king's harem, being promised all the fancy clothes and the, the special foods and, and all the perfumes and cosmetics and having the best of everything. But that's a world thing. And we know these world things don't usually work out, do they? And they, if they were paying attention, they would have known that. So, the king ended up with the girls, many of them. 
verses 5 through 7. It said, Now there was a Jew in Susi, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, the Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captivities, carried away with Job, Je Jehoaniah, yeah, whatever, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Excuse me. There was a Jew. The term Jew comes from Judah. And it was used to refer to exiles of the Israelites. So instead of saying he's an Ips an Israelite who's been taken captive and here uh, in exile, they just said he's a Jew, short for Judah. Okay? Mordecai was a fourth generation captive from Judah. We see that in the, the genealogy he has here. The Jahar uh, was his father, Shemai was his grandfather, and Kish was his grand great-grandfather, and they were Benjaminites. Now that will come into play later here. We will take a look at that. Excuse me again. So, we, we have a little bit of information there about Mordecai. Mordecai is a very important piece of the plan that God is implementing. He's Esther's cousin. He raised her as she, because she was orphaned, and some say that he even adopted her as his own child, that he treated her fatherly. Esther is the main character in this account. Of course, the book is named after her. Her Hebrew name is Hadashas, Hadasha, and that means Myrtle. Her Persian name is Esther, and that means Star. Now, the interesting fact about that, how, how God works things out, the myrtle tree bears a flower that looks like a star. So her Hebrew name and her Persian name kind of go together there. So I thought that was pretty cool when I found that out. So scripture in verse 7 says she had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And that's what they were looking for, for the king. So as we look at verses 8 and 9. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susha the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther was also taken into the king's palace and put in custody with Haggai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor and he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of the food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. So when the king's order goes out, many young women were gathered in the Susha. One commentator said there was as many as 400 young ladies brought in at this time. Okay, uh, that's what one guy said. So, but Esther went. That's the important part. All of them were given to Haggai, who's the head unit, to care for them. And Scripture says that Esther pleased him, and she won his favor. Now, remember when we started this study? I told you there's no mention of God in here. There's no mention of His laws in here. There's no mention of Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah, in here. But we can see God's hand at work in here. Scripture shows us that when God plans to use a person for his purpose, they will be shown favored by others. Joseph, the account of Joseph in uh, Genesis verse 39. In verse 21, Genesis 39 and 21 says this. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in sight of the keeper of the prison. So we know Joseph 
from the account we've studied of Joseph's life, we know that every trial he went through, God put him with somebody, and Joseph found favor with them and continued to move him up through the thing, right? Amen. Daniel's another one. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 9. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Remember when Daniel and them went, when they were taken, uh, he was first generation that was moved out to Babylon. And he found, he found favor with the eunuch when he went to him and said, you know, we're not eating the king's portions. That goes against our laws. We'll let it give us vegetables and, and water and, and test us and see. And because of God's favor and grace, he was allowed to do that. And it goes on and on with both these guys. Every situation they get in, it mentions that God's favor, he, they found favor. God allowed that to happen. So because of Haggai's favor, which is really God's blessing, she quickly received her cosmetics, special food, and seven hand-picked maids from the king's palace to care for her and placed her in the best quarters in the harem. This ensured her 12-month preparation would be completed without delay. So, can you see the hand of God starting to move through here as, as we're dealing with Esther? First, the evil queen there. The, we'll use that phrase for her. Okay. She gets uh, disposed. She's, she's gone. Can't ever come into the king's presence. The king goes to war. He's defeated. Instead of coming back victorious and, and in good spirits, he comes back defeated. Needing to find a new queen. They come up with this plan. Mordecai, who has raised and cared for Esther, decides it would be best if she's put into this plan. She goes there and she's already found favor with the eunuch. So God's hand is upon all this. He's worked the king, he's worked the wise men. And, and, and the farther we get into this, the more you'll see the stuff we've done here in the last couple of weeks, how that is. You can just see it as it starts and it builds all the way through until Esther completes the plan that God has for her there. Verse 10 of uh, Esther chapter 2. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. Now, Mordecai told Esther to keep her heritage a secret. Why? Why would he do that? Well, the first reason is it was part of God's sovereign plan that they were working out. Without them even knowing it, it was part of God's sovereign plan. The, the second part of that reason, the second is, if she was a Persian, she couldn't be queen. And the third thing was, Jews weren't thought very well of at that time frame. They were captives, and the king wouldn't want a captive for a queen. So how did they pull that off? Well, if you remember from when we, we started reading about Mordecai and that, him and, him and Esther, because she's his cousin, are fourth generation into captivity. Okay, So they've been living under the, the Persian laws. All the stuff that, from Israel is four generations out. Now, think about that for a minute with us in our world, okay? Some of us here today have been raised in the church, right, for many years. You know the customs of the church, you know the scriptures, you know how we should live, okay? But as, as time goes on, are the children here? Are the grandchildren here? Are the great-grandchildren for some of us here? As this goes on. In every generation that we're outside the church, God's laws, the Holy Scriptures, all have less meaning in life. And it would have been the same way with Mordecai and Esther. Four generations, that's a long time to live in a heathen society without, any, uh, without their, their normal customs for the Jewish religion, for the Israelites. So it is weakened. So it wasn't a big deal for them not to be kosher. 
You know, uh, we think about Daniel, okay? We referenced him a couple minutes ago. When Daniel was taken, him and, and the other three, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were first generation. They came right out of living under God's laws as, as pure and uh, Hebrews, Israelites, okay, in, in that. So when they went into the to Babylon, they immediately recognized, this ain't right. This ain't right. I'm not eating those foods. That goes against everything we've been taught. But now four generations later, Mordecai and Esther are like, man, eh, you know, yeah, we're Jews, but we'll just keep that to ourselves and see how that goes. So, how did they keep it all secret? Well, again, being kosher wasn't a big deal to them. So, verse 11. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. We're not told how he was connected at that point yet to be able to get that information. He loved and cared for Esther enough that daily he checked on her after he, she was put in this situation. Somehow he was able to get there because they had no outside contact at that point. He checked on her every day. His love and concern, along with that genuine care, were the reason for her obedience. Again, God's hand. How is that with us? You know, we talked a lot about being obedient to God. Why would we do that? Because we know about his love and care and his concern for us. And as we think of that, out of, we, out of respect, and, and because we feel so good about him, knowing that our Heavenly Father feels that way about us, we become obedient. So, I have a question here. Before we judge Mordecai and Esther too, too much, what about us? Do we claim our heavenly citizenship? A couple scriptures I want to share with you here. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 14 through 16. Hebrews 11, 14 through 16. And God's word says this. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And then if we back up to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. The Apostle Paul writes this. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So from that, and we speak about that, we are aliens in this world we live in. Our citizenship is in heaven. We look for a heavenly home, don't we? We all talk about that. We, we do. It comes up. You know, we talk about how upside down our, our culture is now and, and how bad our world has become and our country has fallen apart day by day and that. And then we usually end those conversations, but one day God's going to make it all right. We'll be in paradise with him and everything will be perfect. We look for that heavenly home. Our citizenship, as we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, is already there. Do we proclaim that? Do we speak to that? You know, um, a, lot of, a lot of the things I've read as I've prepared for this, they kind of get on Mordecai and Esther pretty hard. Why didn't they proclaim? Why didn't they speak that they were Jewish, that they were Israelites and under God's hand? Matthew Henry, old-time Bible commentator, write the, writes this, and I quote, Mordecai, he, he, meaning Mordecai, did not bid her to deny her country, nor tell a lie to conceal her parentage. If he told her to do so, she must not have done it. 
but he only told her not to proclaim her country. All truths are not to be spoken at all times, though an untruth is not to be spoken at any time, unquote. See, it, it wasn't necessary. She didn't lie to him. She didn't say, I'm not a Jew. She didn't say, you know, I'm, my heritage goes back four generations ago. We were living in, in Judah. She did none of that. She kept quiet. And God will use that for this specific time. But my original question when I went back to that is, what about us? Do we keep quiet? When we talk about, you know, we're, when we come here and we talk about those things, we, we, we're in a safe place, right? Cone of silence is over us and we're in a protected bubble. It's okay to talk that way. What about when we, when we go to town? When we go to breakfast? We go to the, to the, out to Home Depot or Myers or Walmart or someplace. Do we speak about our citizenship there? Or do we just keep quiet and complain with the rest of the people? See, God had a plan for Esther. And part of that plan through this time was her more. We'll see more as we go. Why this is all still kind of preliminary as we work our way through the study. He had a plan, and part of that plan is for her to become the queen, right? Part of it also is for Mordecai to be moved up in the thing. And they cannot do that if they start right out at the get-go and pro pronounce that they are a Jewish heritage. So God allows them to keep quiet about that. But he doesn't call us to that. He calls us to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. To proclaim our future home in heaven. People need to hear it. You know, I've said over and over, and I'll continue to say it. If, if people hadn't spoke the gospel of Jesus Christ to us at some point in our life, where would we be? Some of us probably wouldn't be alive today. The old lives we lived. But yet, somebody spoke it to us. Jesus is the answer. And it's okay that our citizenship today is in heaven. And we live greatly for that. But in the meantime, God has a purpose for us. Just as he does Esther and Mordecai. So we have to be prepared to live that. We have to be prepared to speak that. And not worry about what the world thinks. We're very fortunate that we're here in America right now because we can do that without being punished. But you know, the, the more I read and the more that, that's happening, there's a day coming when it's not going to be that way in America either. So we have to, we have to do it now. There's another line in the scripture, it's in, I believe it's in chapter 4 of, of Esther, where Mordecai tells Esther, this is a little preview, that she was made for such a time as this, that time. We were made for such a time as we're in today. Every one of us has a circle of influence where we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ, where God's purpose and plan for us can be handed out. Maybe it's work, maybe it's just in your neighborhood, your family. God's called us to that. Proclaim it. We have such a privilege to do that. He didn't need us to do that. God's God. He can speak that. And everybody would willingly believe in him and follow his son, Jesus Christ. But yet he called us to take care of that. We'll look more into Esther and, and what's going on there and the queen selection and that. Uh, uh, one of the uh, newer commentators, he said, this is like a... a uh, Old-timey bachelorette thing. Y'all know what bachelorette is on TV, right? So carefully, we're not watching that, but anyway, it's there. And he said, you know, it's kind of what that was back then. You know, when it happens here, it's humanistic and it's worldly, and it was the same way back then. So please, continue to pray for one another. Continue to prepare yourself and ask God to give you opportunities to speak his love and his concern for us. It's
Amen. Father, we come to you today. Lord, we thank you and praise you for all you've done for us. Once again, we want to thank you for your written word as you continue to show us, even without mentioning your own name, how your hands upon things, how you are guiding and directing all these things that happen in our lives today as you did for Esther and Mordecai. Father, we pray that we have hearts that are humble at your feet, Father, and at the feet of Jesus Christ who died on the cross of Calvary, that we could have this relationship and even to be able to talk to you. Father, I pray that you will open doors for us to share this message with the lost and dying world. Father, I pray that you would prepare us to be able to speak on your behalf. We know the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed us. Father, we all know people, not to be judgmental, but we all know people who could use a Savior today. Father, we want you to know how much we love you, how much we adore you, and we thank you and praise you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Sanders.